say this this man has been right at the top of the list of back shots for, mm. for a long time. Um, it's been a long chase, it's a long, long list as well. Yeah, it is a long <laughs> list. And Pav's been right up the top. Matthew Pavlis joins us. Welcome, Pav. Welcome to Back Chat. I'm finally here, Sco. It's yes. been a while. Yes. <laughs> it's good. I haven't dodged you, by the way. I might have tried to dodge you back in the field back in the day, but I haven't tried to dodge you on the podcast. Don't take it personally. Yeah, right? well, dodging equates to you kicking goals. We'll get to that <laughs> a little bit later on. Um, uh, a very big thank you to our supporters and, and our sponsors, Whippersnapper, Margaret River Roasting, Blue Bet Shelter, and, of course, Leadable Cameras. Sign up to Patreon. Find everything you need at backchatpodcast.com.au. Now, Pav, the first question we ask every guest, it's mm. the same. And you've, it actually has to do with the trophy you were just oh, talking really? about. Oh, really? Okay. So we ask our, our, our guests, we want to know your greatest sporting achievement, but we know you've done a lot of good things on the football field. Yeah. Multiple best and fairest winner, multiple Australian winner, um, captain of a football club. Look, it's great. It's pretty good. It's, it's, it's good, but we're here to tell you. But first up, anyway, we'd like to know what else you can do. What's your greatest sporting achievement not on the football field? Now, Dan, oh, of it's, course. It's no five for 16 <laughs> in the under 12s. Could have guessed that. T eight. What does TH double C stand for? Oh, Chute Hill Cricket Club. Of course it yeah. is. I mean, yeah. yeah the it Lions. Speaks for itself. <laughs> the Lions? Yeah. How, what were the Lions like in the under Premier 12s? Club. Yeah. Premier Club, yeah. We yeah, I mean, showed, we made a grand final. We showed Justin Langer. We had JL on the pod a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and... Um, he wasn't too impressed. He said he would have absolutely he smacked talked. me around the park. <laughs> what 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 other sporting realm? Uh, okay, well, I'm going to go the under twelves. Good, only yeah. because it's the same yeah. age. Um, state champion athletic carnival. Now, when I say state, like state's a loose word. It might have been like <laughs> our region. Yeah, our, our region <laughs> in the western suburbs of South Australia of Adelaide. Um, but I won the champion boy at an athletics carnival. You know, when I was in year seven or whatever it was. So. I think I've got this photo at home, you know, red face, you know, sunburnt uh, in my school kit with the, the medallion around my neck. But I only, I sort of had one first, which was from the long jump. And then I had like all these seconds. So it was like <laughs> second in the hundred, second in the 400, se- very so consistent. consistent. Yeah. <laughs> Just couldn't quite. Yeah. So I must've got there somehow on points uh, yeah. uh, rather than a uh, number of blue ribbons. But yeah, that's that's my crowning uh, glory that's, athletically. That's working smarter, not harder. That's spot on. I was under eight. Uh, 80 meter hurdle state champion hurdles yes hurdles. wow you, you were quite a good runner though that was your thing like yeah. as in coming through well, yeah, it was I always was an athlete athlete yeah I was, an athlete. I was that one of those guys who was the athlete draft the athlete teach him to play footy later <laughs> that's why i turned into a scragging fullback <laughs> now uh, i want to get into you though pav you're south australian um uh, mum uh, jan dad mm-hmm. steve dad steve uh, played a fair bit of sample footy a lot of yeah. a lot of footy so you grew up around football i certainly did yeah um so dad uh played you know for a long long time in the snfl coached um in the snfl the reserves team the assistant coach um and i'll get to that about my kind of growing up around a footy club because it it certainly felt that way his two brothers um mark and greg also played with west torrens in the snfl so um I mean, I was the eldest of our family, so footy was always there. It was always kind of this thing, but never ever did I feel pressured. Um, never ever, I mean, I was sort of encouraged to get out and have fun, cricket, sport, you know, anything, anything uh, and everything I was into growing up. But um, footy was al- always present. Um, and I remember going, you know, when Dad was assistant coach and, and then coaching um, as well, it was always, I'd, I'd go to all the training sessions, I'd, I'd sit on the massage benches and, you know, get the smells and hear the sounds and the language that often gets <laughs> yeah. talked about in a footy club uh, and then I'd go and sit on the bench when dad was coaching some of the reserves games and got this great these amazing memories of hearing the big slaps and the sounds and those a little kid it's like wow this is pretty intense and so that was always kind of kind of with me so yeah it was always there certainly never um pressured but um a great experience of, of learning what the game not necessarily you know tactics but just the fabric of the game being in in you know club rooms and change rooms for a long period of time even when I was quite young was your dad's um, time in the game at Sample ever father son related like was there ever a chance no. to go to an Adelaide oh, or a Port Adelaide that's was, a really good question um, I was kind of no, trying to search but yeah I don't think so I, so dad dad was injured a lot so he had mum and dad had this pretty significant car accident when uh, he was sort of in his prime yeah unfortunately mum went through the windscreen and was yes. sort of kind of lucky wow. to survive he smashed his leg and ankle and it basically set him back two years and then he you know did his knee and shoulder he was basically injury prone but he, he eked out um sort of 130 odd games um so i think that limited him for um 
it was like 150, I think. Yes. So, no, never a chance. But, I mean, as a 16-year-old, I'd played in the under-18 at the under 18 carnival. I had a reasonable carnival in – that was year 11 and was hoping as a 16-year-old – um, to be you know, picked up by one of the Adelaide clubs. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. Because in that draft year, they, they had one pick each of a 17-year-old yeah. they could select, and they didn't take you. No, so I took it personally. Yeah. <laughs> Did you? Well, I mean... I'd absolutely, yeah. I mean, uh, so I still remember draft day sitting at home. I used to be on Channel 7 back in the day. Um, this is in the late 90s. So this is... Black 90, and white TV. Yeah, yeah. 1998. <laughs> um, and so sitting at home watching this, and, you know, I knew um, I was never going to be taken in the top um, 20 or 30 or whatever it may have been um, but heard a lot of guys that I played with so Nick Fosdyke went to the, um, the Swans earlier that year Ryan Fitzgerald Fitzy went to the Swans also uh, James Begley went to St Kilda like yeah, a lot of guys that I played in the SNFL state team went um, in the top sort of 20 or 30 and then Port Adelaide had a pick in about the 30s and took a guy called Adam Morgan from Victoria as their 17 year old and I thought oh I've only got one crack at this left and kept hanging in there hanging in there until about pick 70 or 80 and the Crows took a guy called Ken McGregor who was a teammate of mine Kenny uh, at, at Woodville West Torrens at the Eagles and um, and I, I I loved Kenny he was one of my like good mates that I played with but forever after that period Kenny sort of became this like much love hated figure at the He's Crows defender. because Defender, played a bit forward, yeah. um, played 150 games. Yeah. So, you know, a good pick if you're looking at someone taken in the in the 70s or 80s as a 17-year-old, a bit of a punt. Um, but Paul Kenny, I think, always copped it because, um, you know, as it turned out, I went, you know, early the next year to Fremantle and sort of, you know, history um, goes, goes, goes by. But um, he was sort of always the whipping boy because, you know, they didn't pick up this other uh, fat kid that used to play <laughs> Wood yeah. Forest well, You know how you can tell Pav has remembered and hasn't let go in. He knows the names, names, he knows the draft picks. How many, he knows how many games did Adam Morgan play, do you remember? <laughs> uh, zero, I think. But I don't, I I don't know three. exactly. I think it was three. I <laughs> like, so I've got a quote to read you. I don't know okay. if you know who it's from. Oh, sorry. This one you will know who it's from. Um, uh, a, a couple of things. I, just having a research, I just had a, a good chuckle. It sounded like something my mum would do. So um, they miss you as a 17-year-old. Yep. The draft comes around. You do get picked up by Fremantle eventually. But before that, your mum was pretty keen to keep you in <laughs> South Australia. And Jan, um, with the Fremantle recruiting staff rocking up, had a list of basically better people to draft. Yeah. Um, yeah. Than Matty Pavlich. I mean, it was I was horrified in this meeting. So we're sitting around, you know, sort of similar type of setup at home in, in Kidman Park in South Australia, sitting on Mum and Dad's orange like velvet kind of couch <laughs> yes. back in the late nineties. Yes. Can't believe what they were thinking with that thing. But <laughs> we're cool sitting now. there. It'd be cool now. It, well, we're well, going to be back in fashion, hundred <laughs> percent. Um, and so we're sitting around, there's, you know, um, Jared McNeil and Neil McLean, Brent Dawkins, Phil Smart, basically the recruiting and um, team of, of Frio. And it's, you know, having a chat about asking me questions, asking mum and dad questions is all, you know, that, that kind of happens when you're getting interviewed for a, a job, really. Um, and instead of mum sort of answering the question, she um, went back with them saying, oh, what, why aren't you looking at um, Darren Glass? Or why aren't you looking at <laughs> so-and-so from Perth Footy Club? Or why aren't you looking at... She'd done her research and saying, don't take my son out of Adelaide. Um, you know, stick with some local talent. Um, unfortunately for her, and not only did I get drafted, but here I am 20-odd years yeah, later still, still in still Perth. So. Correct. I, I, if she's anything like mum, I'm sure she's extremely proud and happy you've made a good she life has, of yourself yeah. over here. So um, I had a look at that draft. Jeez, it was a bloody good draft. Josh mm. Fraser was in there. Lee Brown, of course, went with you with, with Hazelby. So Hazelby picked two. Mm -hmm. uh, you pick four. Lee Brown picked five. So Freo was stacked at the top of this draft. But you mentioned Darren Glass, Luke McFarlane, who yep. gets drafted to Hawthorne, comes back to Freo. Um, Brad Green... Uh, Paul Chapman, Adam Hunter, Jonathan Brown. Um, it's a I think I remember Geelong and G the Bulldogs. Yeah, Geelong and the Bulldogs absolutely nailed that draft. So Joel Corey, Joel, Corey Enright. Yeah, Corey, uh, Corey Enright, Ling Chapman, and they had a, they even had someone earlier like a, a Foster who was a SA kid who didn't necessarily, but they just they got that draft right. And the Bulldogs had Ryan Hargrave, Mitch Hahn off the top of my head. Bob Murphy went. Yep. Um, and I think you said Gia. So, you know, when you sort of remember playing against these guys growing up and they all kind of get drafted at the same time and you watch their career, they, they absolutely nailed the draft. Um, so, yeah, a really, a really impressive draft year. Um, but my first, uh, my first 
period coming into the AFL wasn't wasn't great. Well, correct. So I, I want to read. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you you finish your career as the greatest ever Freo docker. But this is a quote from you before the draft. If I was to be drafted by Fremantle, it would be my worst nightmare come true. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying hard not to get drafted. Yeah, yeah. Say, How did pick you up? Yeah. Mum's getting you away. Your worst they, nightmare come true. They called my bluff. <laughs> they did. Um, yeah, I mean, look, it was my worst because I, I didn't, I'm probably like you, Scott, you, yeah. you know, you're on the other side of the country. Uh, you don't know anyone in Western Australia at all. And um, there's trepidation and, and a lot of anxiety about, packing your bags as a 17 year old and heading across the other side of the country and it gets worse for me because day one uh wasn't wasn't much fun so tell me about yeah, it so That's next on my list well let, let's let's build a little bit of context so <laughs> we get drafted you know the drafts in um uh you know mid late november um my schoolies week for year 12 and all that was was always where, coinciding where at the go? same time what? so victor harbour yep. in, in south australia is the place to go as it is you know it, there's always locations rottnest or down south i think is yeah. WA. that's Bo- a thing byron bay is over byron right. bay is a thing gold coast used to be a thing i'm not yeah. sure if, <laughs> Too if <often>. it's a leg <laughs> anyway so victor harbour was our thing and you know i was just there with a bunch of mates who were camping and you know having a great time probably just on the waters getting ready just to play on the waters yep. on the you know lettuce and carrot and making sure <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> elite condition. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, you know, the following weekend, pack my bags and we're heading to heading to Perth. I landed on Sunday night. You know, get picked up by the host family. Um, have this, you know, nervous night sleep because you you got your first training session the next day. And anyone listening or in the room, at least take yourself back to the first proper job you've ever had, and like, what were you thinking that that day? What did you? How did you want to? impress how did you want to set yourself up what were you thinking and for me at that time because I had this great history of um football in in, in my blood uh, effectively and this is my dream you know running around the backyard of of my house in Adelaide was I wanted to be in the AFL here I was about to live that dream so I just wanted to impress like so much every um, ball I went for and every cone ran a million miles to the end and <laughs> by the time of the we'd finished this um skill session which was about 90 minutes of ball work i was just gassed like i i'd absolutely cooked myself had had nothing left and it was one of those perth mornings you know it sort of it gets like to 35 before 8 a.m yeah. <laughs> sea breeze finally comes in and cools it it was one of those sort of hot mornings so i'm gassed i'm absolutely cooked i've got nothing left and the running coach training's you, over and your training's mind. done i'm like yeah. this is great we're I'm, you know That's get right. the power aids out boys time to put the feet up <laughs> Um, the running coach comes over and says, "All right, off to the starting line. We have got six one k's." And I'm like, "Oh, jeez, oh. this is this is nasty." Six. Um, running with a bunch of like key position players, sort of our size, and I get around the first four. Okay, I'm sort of hanging on to to the group. I'm running okay. The fifth one, I start to drop off the back, and you know, I'm sort of really battling off the back. But you know, finish the fifth one, cross the line. And we've all been there where you start seeing stars and you're a bit wobbly and I have this big spew <laughs> on the side. I'm like, just, I'm trying to gather myself. Like, come on, this is your first session. You can't cook this. And the running coach came over and said, oh, have you got one more in you? And I was like, wipe and spew off. <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, I'm fine. I've got, I've got one more in me. <laughs> Get to the start line and, you know, I'm just, I'm limping. I'm, I cannot finish this lap. And, um, I basically get two thirds away around Aquinas Oval where we were training, and I had this overwhelming feeling as if I was running closer and closer to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Teammates who now love to re- relive and retell the story say it was like I was going down an escalator and <laughs> 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 collapsed and passed out. And the next passed thing, I, just collapsed and passed out. The oh. next thing I remember is. Um, waking up in Murdoch Hospital wow. like with drips and like all that on me. I'd obviously just completely pushed myself too far, um, dehydrated, and, and I was I was I was like, what? How have I ended up here? I sort of didn't realise that you know the the doc and the physio came running out, threw us in the back of the property van, sped me down the Quinata Freeway to Murdoch Hospital, and you were dead. To, yeah, well they <laughs> we've killed our draft. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Um, so look, it was not the, the, I don't recommend that to people aspiring to, to play in the AFL. I, I was upon reflection or even at the time, I was just so embarrassed. Like I was like, this is, 
this is terrible. Like, what have I done day one? You know, I can't even finish the session. And, you know, now other guys tell the story in a positive light that, oh, you know, you push yourself. The carry- Freo would have loved Yeah, it. but you, at the time, is the guy falling over? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a good look. <laughs> anyway. So then, so then after that, you had some car trouble days I following? I did. I did, yeah. So this is so embarrassing. So... <laughs> Finally get back to training. Like they, they basically said, you know what, take a rest over the, the next couple of days. We'll just build you up slowly. And then on the, the Thursday, we'd, we'd gone down to Port Beach um, for a recovery session, you know, a bit of a swim. And on the way back, we were driving back across the old traffic bridge back into the club. There was going to be a meeting and some weights or whatever. And I was at the back of this, of sort of the convoy, early morning traffic, and guys were zipping in and out, so having a bit of fun. And I went down to change the channel on the radio and sort of took my eye off the road for the moment. And then Troy Cook, who was in front of me, his car felt like it was a, I was about to sit in his back tray. I just went straight up the back oh. of Cookie, smashed hard my... Hard man Cookie yeah, as well. Uh, yeah, his car was hard as well. <laughs> Smash, he, he's... He, I think he's still got the ute and I think the dent was still is still there because I said to him, mate, I'll, I'll fix it up. He's like, oh, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. It's like 20 years he's later. Still got he's still got the dent. I still haven't got my 1985 Subaru Leone. <laughs> Leone. Uh, that, that crashed into the back <laughs> of uh, of Cookie's ute. But So I've passed out day one, crashed my car into a teammate's car day two. Um, yeah, not the ideal way to start an <laughs> AFL career. Do you debut that, that year, your first year? Yeah, yeah, I do. It takes a while. I... Um, uh, so Paul Hayes will be in Brownie, Lee Brown play in round one against Geelong. Um, and I, I don't, I, I mean, I, I probably, and this is my view on, on the AFL draft age, I still think the draft age should be lifted. And I think there's um, things with the whole system about the pathway that, that can be changed. And I think now's a really good time that um, the AFL can do it. They've signed four, four and a half billion dollar media rights deal and they can really start to plan for the future. That's a side. That's a side point. But I wasn't really ready to play. We we're a young um, and up and coming team, so we all got opportunities early, including, as I said, Hayes and Brownie uh, early in that year. Justin Longmuir was was there at the same time. He'd only been there for twelve months and played, I think, one or two games. So he was playing and sort of almost leading our ruck mm. um, at, at a really young age. Um, so I played round round four at the Wacker. Um, in my debut game um, under lights um, in round f- sorry round five and uh, got to live out a boyhood dream run out in my first AFL game and the, ch- the childhood uh, hero and idol of mine Tony Modra who'd been you Godra know, Godra who I <laughs> used to you know, adore going to footy park and watch him take hangers and kick bags at 13 and 14 there I was standing alongside Mods in the Ford Pocket in my first AFL game. It was um, a pretty cool experience. Oh, anyone I know from South Australia, Sam Butler being, he's been a big part of this podcast, yeah. refers to him as Godra. <laughs> and the fact that you played with, I would say Butsy would be extremely jealous that you got to step on a field with Mods. Tony Modra. Yeah. I, and, and you know when you play, and that era was, um, you know, still kind of that semi-professional really. It was full time, but it was just yes, guys were still working. But Mods... When he footy trained and when he let out from full forward and took the ball out like this and went through his routine, it was the most professional. It was a really, it was a shining light of like what oh, training at a really high intensity looks like. Right. He hated running. He hated weights. He hated like all the ancillary stuff that <laughs> you have to do as a professional footballer. But like his skill set of pushing off, running a million miles an hour, clunking it out there and going back and kicking the goal or recovering and, you know, snapping goals elite sort of training and preparation. Really? Um, so it was great to see firsthand, you know, literally right next to him. Did, did he used to practice hangers or was that just naturally? No, he, yeah, absolutely. He he'd get the bag hangers. out and take hangers and he'd, he'd, you know, roll the ball out in front and kick snapshots. You know, he used to soccer yeah. the goals off the ground all the time. Yeah. He'd, he'd do all that at training. Right. Um, he, as I said though, he didn't like recovery, didn't like restretching, he didn't like, you know, <laughs> any type of stuff that you do as a professional guy but on the field put a ball out there and you know put some goals he was a elite trainer we've had a lot of members on this podcast guests on this podcast in the footy realm now, of course we stepped outside of that now but um first kick first goal um and you're a member of that club yeah but you're a member of the second the kick, second goal <laughs> yeah. You, you, yeah your first two kicks were goals Yep. Yeah. So uh, Alistair Nicholson um he was playing on us that night and um he's now the is he the cricketers or he might be the coaches association yep. CEO who I think is at the uh, cricket there for a while. So yeah, sort of within the first 50 seconds or not even that, the first 20 seconds, ball kind of went out. Brendan Fuster um, kicked it on his left and it just landed on my chest, like kind of this floater and 
kicked a goal, and then yeah, a few minutes later, kicked the second. So um, yeah, started nicely. And then so I had the compliment not long into that first quarter with David Neitz, um, legend kind of of the game, full forward, pot played a bit back. They swapped him and David Neitz started playing on me. <laughs> I didn't touch it after that. <laughs> <laughs> I did not go near it. So it was a, it was a good lesson of, uh, you know, it's not all beer and Skittles in the AFL. So we had a quick look at Sir Swamp Thing. He always got some good stats. He, he tweeted out... Um, so this is players kicking goal in the opening minute of their debut. So you're in this list, obviously. 36 seconds for Mitch Brown. Crazy. 46 wow. seconds, Stephen Hill. 51 seconds, Scott Lysette, who was on the podcast just recently. And then 52 seconds, Matthew Pavlich. And then uh, 59 seconds, Chris Dawes. So you're, you're in a pretty elite list of people there. Um, <laughs> and then for that second goal, I don't think... We definitely have had uh, we two, from two. two from two. Well, I don't How know. How many people are on I that? I mean, list? it sounded like you started well as a forward. But uh, like I did want to start pretty early on this podcast... You, you might you may actually be a backman, Pat. I mean, you were all Australian as a backman. Do you make that switch? Like, did you start as a forward and they thought oh, it's not working? Like, how did you go? How did you get back? Yeah. Well, I mean, in the year I was talking about, where I was hoping to get drafted as a six, as the seventeen year old, I played um, in the state team as a centre half back, and in the under nineteen premiership that year at Woodworth Thrones uh, as as a centre half back. So. Most of my football probably growing up was forward or mid um, as kind of, I guess, the more kind of talented kids that come through tend to play. But um, I had had opportunity to, to go down back in a couple of those years and I think there was always that versatility, which, you know, um, coaches these days absolutely love because of the rotation system of like how it all works out um yes you've got your core forwards and backs but sort of everyone who's a hybrid kind of player can play wing half forward half back inside um outside so i think it was always a great strength of mine uh, a good sort of thing to have in your toolkit to to be able to play that but um yeah i mean quite early on i got i got shifted back um Probably because as an 18-year-old, you're still learning your way as a key forward. So I got shifted back and found my way back there. 2002, when Chris Connolly came, I basically played centre-half back, full-back that year. Yes, and you're All-Australian, full-back All-Australian that year. Yeah, which came, I mean, I was 20 or whatever it was and felt um, felt really early and, and whatever, but um, it was a, a nice surprise. You won your first Doig medal, the first best and fairest that year. But before that, end of your second year, you asked for a trade. Yeah. You, you rang the club and said... If there's an opportunity to trade me, can you do it? Is that right? That's right. Yeah, which was a pretty daunting conversation to have as a 19 year old with the CEO of the footy club who yeah. only just landed. Like the club was in, the club was in dire straits. Um, you know, about to lose um, a ton of money um, off the field. On the field, we'd won two games that year. Um, you know, new coach. Uh, you know, sat the coach halfway through 2001. Damien Drum, and it was just a really. And I was homesick. Um, so you add all those things together. I'd come home for the off season, um, and Port Adelaide. Um, I went around to Rob Snowden's house uh, along with Mark Williams and Phil Walsh and a couple of the players, and had a coffee with those guys. Started talking broadly about footy and and what how they saw football, and then how they saw me fitting into Port Adelaide. And um, came home from that thinking, yeah, I'd love to explore an opportunity so sort of rang Cameron Schwab and said um look I know I'm still I've got a, a year in contract and at that point getting out of your contract um sort of happens all the time now but it was harder much yeah. harder yeah and so I said look if somehow you can find a trade then I'm up for that but I understand I'm still in contract um and I didn't want my manager to make I just re still remember wanting to make that that call myself and her just having the chat um, I don't know how Cameron really reflects on on the conversation. Why but did you want it? I, I think because I felt like I'd invested already a lot of myself and my energy and and whatnot and trying to ingratiate myself at the club um, and with their supporter base and everything else that I, I wanted to make that personal phone call and say, you know what, I'm, I'm interested in leaving. Um, I want to tell you personally. It sounds like there's a lot of similarities between Jason Horn Francis and yourself. Like but in that regard? Well, I mean, yeah. he's, he's contracted still last year, South Australian boy, yeah. got home sick, club not going very well, new coach. Yeah. like No, that's a really good point. I hadn't necessarily um, thought about that when he with with him going through that this year, but now you highlight all those things, it, it definitely adds up. It It's just now, 20-odd years later, it's a bit easier to, to get yeah. out of a contract well, than it was well, that, well, that's it. That's what I was thinking. It's like now it's somewhat expected or accepted, but... 
I don't even know if that would have been in the media back when it happened that you'd ask for a trade. No, no, it was very... And this is the other thing, yeah. Um, clubs back then were probably better at kind of... Uh, no, no quarantining or hiding these yeah. things. No and trade radio to be. There was no trade radio. <laughs> there was no these podcasts. Um, yeah, no, I think, yeah, uh, um, I think probably um, it didn't get out. So therefore it didn't really get, get out. And, but I still remember Cameron, like, so I said to Shrubby, you know, I want to leave. He's like, well, Matthew, we're not going to trade you. Yes. So I sort of felt as though that was pretty much a done deal just there right so that phone call you didn't think it was going to happen and it did, never really came well, close I, I think I think they Port Adelaide tried it on in the um, trade period um, but I think they also thought well you know what we'll get him at the end of next year so we won't go all in then yeah. um, right. And but 12 months later you won the best and fairest all Australian yeah felt more comfortable and we invested. won you know 8 or 9 maybe 10 games we were building you know you could kind of feel that young group together the next year we play finals so had your, had your mindset <coughs> shifted like definitely yeah yeah and you know you could see the trend we were on um, I by that stage another 12 months on with that group and just being here in Perth I was at uni and meeting other people here in Western Australia so um, yeah you just I think you're, and you're so immature when you're 19 mm. I know 12 months later, he's too immature. But, you know, um, another it's amazing what 12 months of responsibility within a team and also um, uh, just, you know, ingratiating yourself further in WA. So, I mean, that period of, of your career, 2002, you're All-Australian as fullback. 2003, you're All-Australian as a half-forward flank. 2005, you're centre-half forward All-Australian. 2006... You're on the pine. I think <laughs> I think potentially as a midfielder in one of nah, those Nah, I played – I guess like 03 was I sort of played midfield and half forward. So you were like that rotating fifth mid. Yeah. 2007, <clears throat> you're full forward all Australian and 2008, you're back on the pine. I mean, to do that in the space of six years, seven years, it's pretty inc – it's incredible. No, no one's ever done that across those positions. Like the versatility as a player – incredible yeah and i guess that's what i was saying like the ability to um change it up in the game um on your opponent so you could have a, a fullback sitting on you who's doing a really good job and is sort of negating you but to take them to a stoppage or to take them into a vulnerable position that they don't really expose themselves to um and not hopefully at the detriment of the team structure because that that's really important but um yeah it, it's certainly um having that versatility to play in different positions and change things up on the run was was important so um but I guess ultimately in that period, you know, we so 03 made the finals, um, played the first ever final for free at, at Serbia, got smashed by by Essendon, um, and then 06 was a great run of I think, uh, yeah. So was it eight or nine wins, nine or ten wins in a row? Unfortunately, go down the semi at uh, the prelim to, um, and it would have been amazing uh, a derby grand final similar to 15. 2015. Yeah. Um, both teams, you know, right up there in the thick of it uh, at the right end of the season. Do you um, do you look back at your time playing as a backman? Think that you learnt things that helped you as a hundred percent? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you never seem to you never seem to have the personality of a backman. You seem far too composed. <laughs> what do you mean? What, back, backmen are grumpy. They, they shoot from the hip a bit. You you were just very calm, collected. <laughs> played your role nicely. You just mate. You went, um, you, went running, you went running your mouth off out in the field like backmen do. Well, it's small forwards are yeah, like true. like like key backmen yes. perhaps. Yeah, or, correct. Um, uh, yeah, I guess personality-wise, I'm not sure what I was, but um, look, it definitely helped my game playing back. Yeah, because you play. I, I, in, in that period, I played on Matthew Lloyd, Matthew Richardson, uh, Alistair Lynch, Jonathan Brown, uh, Warren Treadray, like some pretty decent players. Yeah. So you, you get an understanding. I got taught lots of lessons in that. Like you know, I remember getting standing on the full forward line with the whole 50 there was no flooding no zoning no kind of rollback sort of plus ones it was literally Lloydie and I with 60 metres of space <laughs> <laughs> so I got taught all these lessons about body positioning and, and um, you know, kicked a bag on me Warren Treadray one night torched me you know you, you get you get taught and handed lessons in the AFL and if you one way of looking at it is I'm no good and you have those moments we all have them 
the other the other way of looking is, well, what can I learn from this situation, and how can you get better? And um, once you get past the sulking, if you can look at the the, the tape and and think about almost viscerally what you learn. Okay, he had me there, and that's what happened. He pulled me this way, and you can you can use that in other areas of the game. And, and I think when I went back forward and probably played, you know, the majority of the back half of my career as a forward, it certainly helped. You were just talking about some of the you know big matchups, big names. Uh, what about matching up on Scoey? Um, any <laughs> lessons learnt from that? Um, <laughs> any lessons learnt? Well, I'm going to find on Scoey actually. Small podcast. So right. Start with compliment. What's yeah. the, the meat the sandwich? Your sandwich. Yeah. 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 Tea off. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, no. Um, I early double, in, double patty. I please. can't remember. It was early in your career. I think I was sort of playing that hybrid kind of role. And Scoey sort of ran with me all day and didn't really worry, worry about the ball and was basically just focused on stopping me. And because he's a good athlete and because he was a good team man, he basically played his role really well. And then there was a couple of times later in the career that, um, you know, yourself and um, Eric and uh, who were, or Glassy, between the three of them, um, I, 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 I probably felt as I had some good days against the boys and then probably had some bad ones as well. well I mean, when you were telling your story about standing one-on-one with Matty Lloyd, I mean, I'm just thinking I'm standing one-on-one with Matty Pavlich <laughs> and <the laughs> goal square, one, one derby, he kicked eight. Uh, not all on me, I guarantee you not all on me, but you certainly kicked eight goals. You, I think you outscored us as a team. 2012? Yeah. yeah. He did yeah, that I twice in three on. weeks. Did it against GWS as well. Okay. Well, that yeah, I, I can do it. So I'm you're on. So at least you're on. Unless you're in form when I pop back. <laughs> yeah. Well, that that was you know it's one of those days where the ball kind of bounces the right way and you know we'd started well and but yeah um, it was always nice uh, beating West Coast and was that was it was a rivalry real like yeah. we've had we've had you know, Pinky Barlow had Ballantyne on so it was real yeah it definitely was real. I I think there was I mean I played across seventeen years so like. Um, there was probably different kind of it, it ebbed and flowed. I think in terms of my second der- ever derby was the demolition derby. Was that when they were wearing that jumper there? Yep. <coughs> yeah. So yeah, you know, G- Gardy. Imagine Michael Gardner in that. Yeah, Gardy comes out throwing haymakers at me. Um, can you remember that? Can you tell us? Like, you well, know, so you were Ga- young, right? Yeah, I was eighteen. <laughs> um, and and Gardy had been out with a shot. I mean, both teams at that year had um, had a really poor season. The you know, bottom bottom sort of half of the ladder. And um, Gardy had been out with a shoulder injury and he had this big, you know, he could hardly kind of move it. He's sort of strapped to, to, to all, all sorts. And I went down, I was playing full back and he was playing full forward and I went down and bumped his shoulder. It was like, you know, he's been out, let's just test, see what's going on. And then he just started throwing punches. <laughs> I wasn't <laughs> expecting that. And I just couldn't get anywhere near him because he's got such a long reach and, and plus I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and then I remember slipping over, which I think kind of helped me because by that stage there was a free kick given away and there was another spot fire. And then like just I, I would still remember like visibly seeing – the, the one that happened early in that first quarter where Dale started going berserk and there was just this all in. And I remember standing at like full forward going, what do we do here? What happens? <laughs> it's sort of just running. The rules? But like, yeah, there were no rules. There was just like, and then it was crazy that game. And then, you know, we win by a point. I actually got yeah. knocked out later in the game for a different reason. Um, Ash McIntosh ran through me um, kind of, it was just, it was no rules that game. Um, so, that was that was intense. I landed in an intense like we hate them. Yeah. We need to beat them kind of thing. And then it, I think it it probably mellowed slightly for a little period, and then it heated up again. When did you arrive at the club? 06? 07. 07, 07, yeah. 06, 07, uh, end of 06. So when the Car Brothers. Yep. You know, there's that sort of derby. Yeah. Um, Shawnee Mack spoke about that on yep. the podcast. Basically, he was captain. I think co-captain, and he talked about a meeting before that game where they basically we're just going to fight them. Yeah, well, it was, it was about, it was like, okay, there's a fair bit of noise going around. It Like, we're just going to go verbally and physically at every opportunity here. Yeah. So at that point in time, obviously pretty well known what was going on, but it was just like, you know what, it's time to kind of, so yeah, it kind of went through these. And then I don't really think, I can't really, like from 2010 onwards until when I retired, there was maybe a few moments but it was more just we wanted to beat each other it wasn't necessarily well what was your view I well yeah no it was real it was real like I remember playing in my first derby and it was and it was such a step above in 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 intensity like it was as close to a final as you would get yeah. in a regular season well would you agree with that 100 percent. I remember like my first one I remember sort of like you and with Guardy but I was coming off the top of the I was sort of a high half back and just running into the first contest and there was just bodies just 
like men smack and I was like yeah. what is going on like yeah. same thing I was like I don't know what, you, you were saying that at a fight I was looking at the football game like <laughs> what is going on I remember one you and I just I hadn't written it down but um, I was at one stage of my career I was allowed to kick out they, they, they used yeah. to I was the designated kicker not sure what extra possessions yeah, probably potentially when we won the wooden spoon in 2010 somewhere there <laughs> um, and and I'd, I missed one it was early in a derby <clears throat> kicked it straight down um, a Freo player's throat behind all right, here's your chance to redeem yourself. Hit another player, hit another <laughs> Frio player straight up, but missed the second set uh-huh. shot. Brad Shepard, an 18 year old, comes up. He goes, Scully, give me. I'm like, get the fuck away from me right now. I get it. I kick it as far as I can. It's a turnover, straight over my head, goal. goal. So three in a row. And I was playing on you that day. And I just, it's probably similar to my, I just thought, well, if I can't, if I can't hit targets, if I can't, I'm just going to fight. So I just grabbed Pav. <laughs> I just started fighting Pav. <laughs> Eric McKenzie's come over to save me because Pav's a bigger man than me. He thought, yeah. so he's, easy takes over with Pav. Easy I can't got, remember this. Eric got, uh, he either got suspended or a fine. He, uh, Michael Johnson came in, he, he punched someone punched someone oh, he was bleeding already, yeah. you and I you were probably trying Wrestling. to get out of it I, was, I started and then I just <laughs> ran off <laughs> so, so that's probably as close but that wasn't a hatred it was it was <laughs> just a, more turning the ball over yeah, yeah it was you know no but uh, yeah and the, the, walking around the street as well like you, you were it was almost you couldn't quarantine yourself from you know oh, smash them this week or uh, you know go the Eagles or whatever it may have been like it was hard to kind of escape that Intensity, just because you're walking around, you're getting your coffee, or you're you know you're going into the supermarket. So you kind of had the internal chat of we want to smash them physically and on the scoreboard, and then you had the external like heat of it. Um, and then yeah, if you turn if if you make a few mistakes, it's a good way of distracting yourself from uh, the mistakes yes, by starting correct, to blue. Correct, and then get out of it. Don't get fined, <laughs> yeah, and then you're good. all good. So um, yeah, apart from the first part of your career, is there, is there any other stages where? There's a potential to go home. Like 2007, there was some talk around contracts. There might have been another period a bit later on. Was there any real chances yeah. that you were... Uh, I mean, Adelaide, um, in about that time, um, sort of came at us with an opportunity, but I was a young captain by that stage and, yeah, it sort of made... I mean, you, you consider these opportunities, but I, I didn't leave. And then uh, Carlton Collingwood, there was, I mean, the year that Juddy um, left, and it was the end of 07, 07. yeah, yeah. Carlton, obviously, they also came sort of to us saying, "Hey, would you consider it?" So I think Pavlich, they had Pavlich Judd. I think the they had two finish. irons in the fire, and then they worked out that we'll, we'll go with Juddy, not Pav. Um, <laughs> so, but um, but at that, even at that stage, I was like, "Look, I'm no, I'm I'm in here for the long haul." I was a young captain and, and was sort of ready to go. There's an opportunity, a little bit of opportunity with Collingwood uh, later in my career, and then the Gold Coast was sort of came with an opportunity that I'd monetary kind of never ever thought was possible um when they first started uh, that was the end of 2010 with their first year 2011 but um i mean we were on our kind of journey with that young team i was yeah. captain and um money was alluring but uh yeah the opportunity wasn't so success was a driver for you with that definitely be- yeah at that point i mean it sounds I, like through your whole career though you- oh yeah but i oh, i mean i wanted to play i was very fortunate i went to a <clears throat> sagra hut college which always won I went, I played an under 19, you know, premiership uh, with Woodvoice Torrens. And so, yeah, I had a lot of success and then got to Freo and we actually had some really dark days in the, the first half of my career with some, you know, finals opportunities along the way. But once I'd started at Freo, once I'd invested so much personally and once I'd become, you know, captain was trying to lead that team in a new direction, um, I was all in and I, I wanted, I wanted success as, as much as the next person, if not more. Did you play well in big games? Were you a big game player um, on, on reflection? I think I played poorly in some big games. I think right. I played well in a, f- a few big games. So if you're talking big games, big finals, there were certainly some finals, I reckon, early in my career <clears throat> that I didn't necessarily handle that well. Um, and then, you know, the two, th- 2006 prelim, I thought I played uh, a really – Really good game as a, as a forward. So when you kicked you kicked eight against Geelong or something. Uh, right? No, Geelong was twenty twelve um, at the MCG in the elimination final. <clears throat> that was um, that was certainly one of the good games. I think I kicked four in the prelim in 05, in oh six, and had a pretty significant influence on that game. Um, I, I think I matured. Like I, I reflect on my early ga- big games um, and early finals, thinking I didn't think I handled the situation well. Mm. 
Um, and then I think I played in some some really good roles. And then in, in the 13 grand final, I don't think any of us handled that situation well early in that game. You um, kicked three that day. Kicked three, but yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's one of those ones where you sort of reflect on and go, geez, I would love to have another opportunity. Is that is that a good memory at this point? No, it's a, it's a pretty crappy memory, yeah. yeah. I mean, everything up until um, probably the last 15, 10, 15, well, we... We started so poorly, you know, we were a, a bunch behind a half time. Third quarter was great. It's like, geez, we're in this game. We can actually win this. Um, uh, Luke Bruce kicks a goal early in the last quarter, which makes it a bit harder. We sort of come back. And then, you know, when you you sort of, there's about 10 minutes left and you're like, <clears throat> we have to throw everything at this to be a chance. Um, and then there's like five minutes left and, we'll, and we still had shots of goal, blokes kick, <laughs> kicking out in the full and, and making bad decisions um, and you lose the game by 15 points. So it was about with, you know, three or four minutes left in that game. We were like, ah, oh, you know, like, cause we were chasing so hard to get ourselves back in the game and still with a legitimate shot, um, you know, eight goals, 14 and whatever it was out in the full way. I don't think about it daily, but <laughs> I do think about it. <coughs> around that sort of time, I remember there being a lot of talk around Freo being like really top heavy. And so, you know, yourself and some of the other stars at the time would really perform, but it was a lot of the other, like the rest of the team. Was that hard to, I mean, a lot of teams and players talk about like keeping the noise outside, but when the same people are showing up every week, but others aren't like, is that tough to deal with, especially while you're captain? Um, I think it happened just slightly before that period. So I think there was a huge reliance on Luke McFarlane, Aaron Sanderland, um, yourself, myself, and probably you know David Mundy, Paul Hazelby, you know, and, and maybe a few others at that point in time to play, and, and maybe the Carboys. If if we didn't play well, then you know we weren't going to win. Um, what Ross Lyon brought was this team ethos, all in. You know what's what's good for one is is good for the other, and a real trademark that we had to bring to life on a daily basis. And the likes of Michael Barlow, Haddon Ballantyne, Nick Servan, Zach Clark, you know, um, so on and so forth, grew. Matthew DeBoer, some of our role players just grew with experience, but also with more responsibility. And so I think in that period we still needed our best players playing at a really really high standard because that was the cream on the cake but everything else had lifted to a level that allow us to, to to compete and to play in finals year after year so 2012 um you know semi-final against the crows 13 the grand final then a um, couple of prelims or, or semi-finals so and it wasn't really that the best players were playing well it was that everyone else stepped up mm. talk to us about ross Lyon. You mentioned ross i yep. mean I see in the media anyone who's played under him really, especially you know people that come out and speak about him are pretty fond of him as a coach. Yeah, he's the best coach I had, but he he's a hard taskmaster. Like he, and he starts at the top. So if if the leaders aren't playing well, or if the you know the captain's not pulling his way, he just goes a beeline to you. Um, but it was what we needed. It was and it was what I needed to to shift my leadership and to to, to keep evolving. Um, you know, he there's there's plenty of stories about him giving me great sprays at half time and we might get to those. But when he first came in, um, it was like, no, no, we're setting new standards on on, you know, fitness, on game plan and on, you know, trademark, you know, living and breathing it day in and day out. So Sorry. what are you laughing at? I was just you gave like a very good Ross Lyon three, you know, when he talks in the meter media sorry he always gives like a, a something yeah. a something yeah. a something <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, you know it's not <laughs> ideal <Yeah. laughs> sorry well, no well, he does so but he was and at that point in time his game plan was you know the press lock it in your front half repeat entries turn the ball over and it was dour um and it wasn't necessarily that attractive but it got results and so um and we just and you know he, he was very tactical about wingers and um and midfield flips and various things. So he brought a whole new IP and knowledge and as well, like hard nosed. And he was so brutal. Like some of it, he's so sarcastic and brutal, his feedback. Like he, What's up, tell you uh, what? like, you know, you're, you're a great person, but <laughs> <laughs> basically real off all the things you shit at. Um, you know, this and sort of sarcastic. Of course you'd kick it out in the full there. Or like, you know, remember this half one at half time is, uh, you get the ball at half forward and you go back, you, think, you put the ball down. He's talking to Paul Duffin. You get your comb out, you're combing your hair, <laughs> taking your 
the time. How about you get the ball inside the Ford 50? You know, like, <laughs> just, just sort of these sarcastic, like, yeah. And he gives me a ripper in his first year. We're up at the Gold Coast. Speaking of the Gold Coast, we're up at the Gold Coast playing an expansion team. We're getting done at half time. It's one of those slippery kind of um, early season games where it's shocking, humid. Shocking and, and, yeah. and we're getting we're getting smacked. And um, I'd hardly touched it playing as a forward. And he's he's come in he's and I've um, stripped off because it was so wet and so so new new jumper, new shorts, got a towel, was like, you know, getting ready. I think I went and saw the physio as we were in our groups and I was getting ready for the second half. Anyway, we finally all come into the and he's like, he's just made a he said, have a look at our captain. He looks pristine. Hasn't got a bead of sweat on him. He wouldn't bruise a grape. Like he, he's basically rolling out all there. And I'm just like, I'm going to have to cop this one. I can't say anything. Have a look and, at our Have a look at that. He looks pristine. Anyway, so we go out. Um, you know, we I, I actually play in the midfield in the second half. We sort of wrestle our way. It was a hard fought match. I think, you know, um, we got ourselves across the line. We win the game get into the change rooms afterwards and it was the flattest I've ever he- heard a team song ever. Like, you know, we've <laughs> right. sort of fought hard for this victory, but everyone's like, oh, free, oh, way to go. Sort of thing. Like, <laughs> so flat that we'd won. We're on the way, um, well, you know, you get showered and at that point in time, there was no flight back, I don't think, from the Gold Coast to Perth. So right. it was the bus up to Brizzy right. and then the flight back. Uh, and anyway, we're all sort of, you know, moaning and groaning on the way to the bus and we, we get on the bus and I'm sitting by myself and Ross makes a beeline for me and sits right next to me and I'm like, oh, fuck, like, <laughs> sit next to the coach after going, this is not, this oh, is not, not good. good. That's never a good thing. Our trip to Brizzy. Anyway, he started talking about like the whole story about how he got to Frio and he's like warts and all and he's like saying how much money that he'd, you know, he'd, he'd, anyway. The whole thing. Yeah. He's given, and I, I didn't say a word. Like he basically <laughs> spoke for sixty minutes, and I'm sitting there going, "What's this is this is interesting?" But like, what's going on here? Anyway, I get off the bus. This is your life, and <laughs> yeah, it was. Get off the bus, and uh, Chris Bond, the footy manager, comes over and goes, "I oh, did Ross catch it?" And I was like, "Yeah, he just been telling me his life story on the bus." <laughs> he goes, "Oh yeah, I, th- I think that's what his way of apologising for the spray at half time." <laughs> <laughs> Apparently Bondi had told him, oh, you realise, you know, Pav had sort of went and got the towel and sort of showered and all that kind of stuff. And Ross, oh, geez, so he's made a beeline for me and had to... But he's, he didn't say sorry. He just told me his life story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's unreal. I bloody love that. Do you think you'll do, you think you'll do a good job at St Kilda? Yeah, I think he will. Um, Difficult uh, to tell, obviously. What I, what I like about their list is they're a bit of an older list, you know, fourth or fifth older list. Sorry. I don't necessarily like that for their development and where they can go, but I like it for Ross because I think, you know, this notion that he can't rebuild a bit of a, I think that's a bit of folly, but I, what I what I do like is that he can go in and shift pretty quickly a group that has been sort of, you know, eighth, ninth, tenth, seventh, you know, and around the mark, and he'll be able to straighten them up um, and, and really drive high performance because that's, that's what he does well. When you reflect back on your career, um, uh, you know, like just, just, doing a bit of research but playing on you playing against you seeing on your field looking at your stats the, the best and fairest six best and fairest no, eight best and fairest you I'll know. take out I think it was six so <laughs> six best and fairest six all Australians it was top three for a decade you're in the you're in the 350 700 goal club um, what you've been able to do on the field uh, I, I think if you're a Melbourne based player would have you in like a realm above where you are now, which is a great. You've been inducted into the Hall of Fame, so clearly you've done a lot of things. But <laughs> do you think your time in Perth is out of the limelight? Um, I think it's certainly out of the limelight, but um, I think there's an element that I, I kind of like about that. Um, I still don't... So the, the whole notion of, oh, you know, if he was playing in Melbourne, like, what, is, what does that even mean? True. <laughs> what is that? I don't, actually don't know what that means when people say, oh, if he was playing in Melbourne, he'd be... Well, that's just opinion. That's just public comment. It's not. Um, it's not kind of the stuff that you're talking about, or the people that you play against, or the people that you play with, um, and how they respect you. And so, when I when I think about players that I played on that were really hard, they don't necessarily have been recognised in those things that you're talking about, or verbally. It's like, gee, he was a good player, like, and people don't recognise that. Um, like Mark Bolton, I remember at Essendon used to tag me and. 
who's Mark Bolton? He was, like, he was this really athletic, strong player that I really found it hard to, to play against. Brad Scott, who is probably well, almost better known for his coaching, when I played in the midfield, he used to tag me, and I'd hardly get a, you know, hardly get a kick. So there's, but neither of those guys are in the Hall of Fame or you know, been multiple All Australians, etc. So um, yeah, the respect that you have for other guys on the field because you've been out there bashing each other for two hours year after year um, is different to and things that I appeal to more rather than what someone in Melbourne thinks. I read, I read an article you wrote recently around um, you reflecting back on your career and in your darkest moments, whatever you want to call it, you look back at some failures. And, and yeah. um, is, is that around the, 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 the premiership stuff that you did write about that? Not no, definitely. Premiership? Yeah, I mean, in my worst moments, I look at life as yes and no and binary. Mm. when there's a whole heap of grey, like my hair these days. <laughs> <laughs> like, did I win a premiership? No. So in my bad days, I go, well, I failed. Like, that, that is just how you, and it, you know, I think that is similar to how some people think. Did I sell my business and become really successful? Or did I finish that uni degree? No, I bailed out and I've always done that. Or did I, you know, change jobs and I have ch- chopped and changed and I've never really found my way. Like, there's this feeling at times when you kind of go well you know what i haven't i haven't succeeded now i can intellectualize the fact that that's all bullshit Mm. and i can work through that you know the relationships and the people you meet the great opportunities the game of afl has afforded me and my family all the all the goodwill and everything else i know you can intellectualize it but what i'm feeling in my bad times that's just what i'm feeling and that's okay as well and you have to kind of be in that space and I think it helps getting older. It certainly helps having kids and family. But, um, yeah, I think there's times where you look back and go, well, my ultimate goal as an AFL player, as a captain, was to win a premiership, and it's not there. So I have to deal with that. Yeah. yeah I mean, you had some really strong patches at the Freo Footy Club, right? You spoke about, uh, yeah, 06, that prelim, you know, 13, 14, 15. Is, is 13 the year that... You know, you make the grand final and you lose, but like, now fifteen was, was so fifteen for me was harder because so thirteen, um, two thousand thirteen was sort of a great year and a bad year. We had our first child, Harper, our beautiful little daughter. So it was just like the best party of your life and the most incredible time. Yeah, uh, and challenging, by the way. Like it's not all beer and skittles having kids. Our, our kids are shit sleepers, and it's been it's been a battle <laughs> raising Welcome. them. Well, yeah, exactly. back chat. the parents podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's a whole other yes. thing. Um, and then I was injured for a bunch of thirteen with you know Achilles and and, and various things. I reflect back because 15, you know, we were rock hard fit. We'd won nine in a row to start the year. We'd sort of had some fits and spurts. I got injured. A few other guys got injured. But we got ourselves to a home prelim against the Hawks. And I still remember, you know, we're right in that game again, right up until the last. And then, you know, they sort of kick away late. But lose that game. And I'd, I'd ping my calf in the last quarter. Did you? Early in the last quarter. So I was limping around. Would and you have played the granny? Well, I, I don't know how I would have, to be honest. But... Wow. Um, I remember like after the game that, you know, and the guys, cause I was potentially coming back to playing or not. That's another thing. But the physio is saying, oh, geez, this would have been a challenge if we had won. Like what would we have done? And, and there could have been, yeah. I, cause you can't really fix a torn calf, right? No, <laughs> so absolutely you can't not. jab it. You can't. No. Anyway, I've, that's another, so it's a hypothetical. It's actually we'll, good to know. Cause I was watching that game cause you play on the Friday night. Yep. You guys we, north on the Saturday. The Saturday yeah. And north. You know, yeah, north yeah. Yeah. And I was watching the game. <laughs> I, I was going for you guys because Hawthorne, um, you know, they they were going for three in a row. Um, not not that uh, you you know they were a better side than you, but they were going to be playing at home. The MCG, if yeah. we we're going to win, and in my head we we're going to win. I wanted to play Freo because I thought we had a better chance of beating Freo. The, the Freo players that we've spoken to, pro- probably similar. Right? Yeah, like you probably thought you had a better chance of beating a West Coast than yep. a North Melbourne or yep. or Hawthorne at the MCG, right? Well, certainly, yeah. I mean, Hawthorne at the MCG. Is- I mean, a pretty hard. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah, not um, great. but West Coast at the, uh, the MCG, a much different proposition. O- Opens slather up, but it's interesting to hear about your calf because yeah. So ping my calf, limping around, you know, dealing with this. Geez, we're still in this game and wanting right. to win it, but then like, shit, can I play in it? Like, you know, you're dealing with that as you're playing, and kind of had to push that out for that moment. Anyway, I lose the game, and I, at that point in time, I remember driving out that night of of my driveway, thinking, is this the last day for game I'm going to ever play? Because wow. I was like sort of, I was 33 or whatever it was and body had started to pack up a bit. And mentally I was like, 
Well, if we get through and, you know, this is probably – but drove out that night thinking this might be it. And so I remember walking back out, like after everyone had gone and just wanting to spend a little bit of time out on the ground just in case this was it. Um, and I just walked out, I was sort of, you know, not far into the ground and then um, – my family came out and I just started crying. Like I was, and it was sort of a moment of eyes. Oh, but I, if I reflect, I reflect back and think now, I know that opportunity for that group was gone that night. Mm. I knew there was no coming back. You know, there was going to be guys retiring. There was going to be transition to the list, and and that kind of period was over. So it was a, it was an outpouring of emotion for, oh God, we've missed our chance. Lost thirteen. Lost tonight we're done. Um, and it's funny how you kind of just know things like that. And yeah. I'm sure everyone's got that in their life, but it was certainly a memory for me. Did anyone What's capture that on camera? Like, did anyone? No. It's like, cause the memories I have after games at Subi Oval are ones when I've been first emergency or red vested or something like that. And you, and you do the laps out and there's always a bit of a couple of scragglers. Yeah. There's a couple of boys in the box still remaining, having some beers. So it was quite late. And I think, I think someone had maybe taken a still, like you know and was sort of rumoring about it but there was no it might have been earlier that night there's footage of luke mcfarlane and his wife walking around because he knew he was retiring right and he's like bawling his eyes out and like this is i'm Before not game? after oh after <laughs> no 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 after the game okay. like no one else in the stand so they got footage of that right. so this is how late it was in the piece that right. you know I, I must have i can't even remember what you know last game of the year you're kind of doing your stuff uh, in in the change rooms and i yeah, walked out and had a bit of just a moment and um and yeah, it sort of broke down. Seven would have had a field day with with footage oh, of yeah, that at, at the time. Uh, did, was there any part of you bigger than Nick Nat? What's in the box? Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> um, was there any part of you uh, that <coughs> was sort of glad that Freo didn't get to that grand final that year without having to feel like, well, I'm glad that I didn't miss out on that opportunity then. Uh, no, so I went to Melbourne. I think, why did I go to Melbourne? I think because we'd committed to some stuff like in around the week. Um, and being there, I was like, I just don't want to be here. Like, you know, you guys are in it. Hawks are in it, about to win their third. I was just like, just get me as far away from Melbourne as possible. <laughs> because, you know, in my mind as well, I was like, well, you know, this could be this could be it as, as well. I don't, you know, I'm limping around with a punk calf. I can hardly move. <laughs> Got two, we've got two young kids who aren't sleeping. Like, this is not a good experience away from home. Um, so, but I mean, no, I would have much rathered us, would have much rathered us be in that game and, you know, potentially try, I mean, having to make that decision of with a with a bunk up, I don't, I don't think I would have got up probably, but yeah, I don't know. Do you remember your last game, 353? I do, yeah. Went into it on 699 goals. Yeah. Uh, forwards, I know enough of them, so you, you would have been... Oh no! It's not about the goals. Not about the milestone. You would have wanted. <laughs> you wouldn't have wanted to finish the career on six nine nine. No, no, I definitely. Won't. I was lucky to get one earlier. Joe the Goose over the top into the goal square, he was um, screaming down the field. Oh well. yeah, no I'd come off went. the bench. Like it was one of those perfect, <laughs> similar to the Aaron Sandler and spoil Lockie Neal, Stephen Hill yeah, yes. change at the in Geelong where he you know, <clears throat> kicked us into a prelim. Um, I'd come off and the ball had sort of transitioned on the other side of the ground. It might have been in from a kicking or something and it was just like over the top, over the top, just link, link, link. And so all I had to do was run from the wing to the goal square and kick the goal That's lit- and scream as loud as I could to get the ball. <laughs> and so I was fortunate enough to, to do that early in the game and get it out of the way. Um, but I, I didn't I, – I think that was the only time I spent time on the bench that game. And I, I later in the – Later in the game, I had three or four shots to go. Miss, miss, miss. So I'm glad I got out the way early. Um, it was no JK kicking eight <laughs> straight or whatever. <laughs> or was. What about that? Oh. Um, but I'm glad. Uh, and like that experience. So, and, you know, there's not often. So, you know, end of 15, make the decision to play again. A challenging year on the field. But we win that last game against the Bulldogs who go on to win. Yeah, so you lit a fire in them, actually. And they came back and beat us. They in the did. Next week. They <laughs> did. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> I'm glad that could be the case. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, but like doing the lap and going out in your own terms and seeing like grown men and women like crying and hugging in the stands, it was, um, it was really almost uncomfortable that you're like, there's 30, 40,000 people there saying goodbye to you. And yeah, it was a really strange but beautiful moment. Um, and I'm, yeah, it will, it will forever be sort of imprinted and to experience that with the family and friends and get everyone across. It was a, a great way to, to exit the game. It's like when 
when it's your birthday and everyone's saying happy birthday to you, it's like, it's awkward. Imagine like yeah. 35,000 people just <laughs> like for you. It's like, it's strange. But look, if you get the opportunity, it's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah, one, day. Time for you, one day. One day I'll do it. Like, you know, it. five to 16. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, um, that's true. We've come to the end of hearing questions from you and I, but, uh, sorry, Dan and I, but just got a few more questions from our audience. Oh, yep. Not social media. Social media. That's right. I I know, yeah, I thought you might. Um, it's a world-renowned podcast segment. Actually, it's been running for a long period of time. The people ask you the questions. Are you ready? Social media. Freo underscore hub. Uh, how did you become so loyal to Fremantle despite the first few years being rough? Additional question. What drove your passion to change the culture at the Dockers? Yeah, so I, I guess I've touched on this yeah. in some ways, but um, what drove me to stay was that every year I had more responsibility. Every year I had more I personally invested into the group, into the team and to Perth. Um, I became so much more, you know, one with the club and I've said I said this as I retired but I feel as though me as a 17 year old and the footy club as a five year old club we sort of grew up together <laughs> um, and had a similar trajectory in that we had lots of tough times but also some pretty good times um, and by the time we you know we, we both parted ways um, you know we were we were much better for, for that relationship so <laughs> actually I've said to someone recently it's like I broke you know six years ago I broke up with a long term girlfriend <laughs> we're just having some time apart like we still love each other but <laughs> both grown we've both grown as, as people <laughs> and better for the experience so um, changing the culture yeah so yeah w- I, I think this sort of goes hand in hand also with me as a young captain you know when you I was 24 25 I was a t- not a great captain when you first that young you kind of just you're a good player and you you want to lead and you're doing the right things but you've got so much to learn and I guess as my learning and understanding of leadership and captaincy grew um so too did our culture and so too did the changing dynamic of our group and again I, I reflect on the guys that we drafted in 2008 2009 Stephen Hill you know all those guys are listed before Ballantyne Barlow um, Silvani Mazungu DeBoer they were just this rock uh, who were hard workers great people had enough skill to play footy um, and who really drove the bus and I was able to kind of well, we and I, I say we, like Aaron Sanderlands, Dave Mundy, Luke McFarlane, we're able to always take our hands off and let them run the show. So, um, yeah, a bit of maturing on my end, but also empowering those guys to grow. It's Wharfy time. It's Wharfy time. <laughs> what, what, it, Watch that this morning, actually. Were you inspired? That highlight. Yeah. Um, so Wharfy was our trademark at the time, and um, I the actual – the thing of Wharfie time, I don't know, that just sort of came out <laughs> at the time. It wasn't anything. Because it was a but pre-game the pre- speech? Is that what yeah, it was? The, the, the previous Kent's week, Hawks. Shawnee Mack had talked about, guys, you know, when you put the jumper on, it's like putting your Superman cape on. You, you can do anything. You run through a brick wall. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I don't mind that. Like that. So, you know, we'd put on our Superman capes and we are going to get out there and do Wharf, Wharfie time um, and <laughs> play our travel. Now, the way, like, the way I was thinking in my head and the way it was delivered... <laughs> So different. <laughs> but I haven't seen it. I, 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 I've going. still got it as a tab up. We're not, you, if you want to, we can watch no, it. No, let's not. Let's not. <laughs> well, you deliver it poorly, did you? No, I think I just, uh, the, the line was, um, put your Superman capes on, it's Wharfy time. <laughs> it's Wharfy time. But, but the thing is. Which I think has become this it. thing, right? It's, if you just said it in the group, right, and ev- and that was it. Like, and like, yeah, come on, it. let's go. And then it'd be fine. But it's <laughs> fact, it was on a microphone and everyone's heard it. It just makes it. So, it, so it's one of those things. So I knew I was mic'd up, obviously. Um, and in my own head, I was going to say something along those lines because that was sort of the theme of the week. Yep. You yes. know, live the trademark, play the trademark um, and put your capes on. Bulletproof, let's go and get them. Um, it's Wolfie time. The way I thought about it, the way I delivered it, much different. <laughs> and look, you know, sometimes that happens when you get a microphone in front of you. <laughs> That's unreal. <laughs> oh, very good. Now, ah, triple underscore Pat dot Smith. Who Southern picks- Riverbend. This is, oh, this, right. This is Patty. Who picks your suits when you're boundary riding match day? Uh, so this, there's two questions to this because the only – so Channel 9, the suits and the ties are chosen for right. you. Right. No, because it's matched into the – everyone's sort of wardrobe. Okay. Yes. You know, whether, what Sherry's wearing or what Tracy's wearing have or like Tomo. And they have wardrobe rooms, though. Yeah, just a – you know, it's one of those bifold kind of things. And um, So there's That's matching. Nice. It's, it's a really – it's a strategic and, and well thought out mm-hmm. process. Um, in terms of what I wear on Fox, I just basically go to the wardrobe and <laughs> pick whatever's in the, in the closet. So Bring clean. your own suit, isn't it? Yeah, Pretty it right. is. Uh, so I think it's a – 
MJ Bale with uh, giving them a shout out for Channel 9 and, and Men's Club look after us with Fox Footy. Mm, so. okay. well, if Men's Club want to extend uh, that offer perhaps to another band driver. Oh, you've Fox missed out on I that. I don't have any suits, <laughs> um, any, any suits provided. So anyone's listening along that wants to jump on board the back chat Fox Footy train. We've got Pav up in, you've, we've, we've, not I, but like we've got you up into the, you're out of the cold weather down the boundary yeah. when I work with you now. Well, Pav. that's where I started. And then COVID hit and it forced me because they're all over in the hub in Melbourne. It yeah. forced me downstairs. So I'm glad to have you back, Scully, because yes. it gets me back <laughs> upstairs. Pab's always very happy to say that. Yeah. When I'm watching the footy, that's the first thing I hear you whinge about is that it's Pab's so warm cold. and you're cold. Well, absolutely. Pab, <laughs> mate, I'll go up there. I've got the party pies not out yet. I'm going to go downstairs and get like half a warm coffee halfway through the game. I was pissing down with the rain the last derby. Mud all over my suit. Oh, it was, wasn't it? That yeah. was brutal. That was that right in front. Of me, copped it, over, copped it in the face. All right, let's kick off. Hard work down there, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, all right. Mitch.s.rogers. How do you, how close do you believe Flag Mantle is? I don't know if you mentioned, you not a Flag What Mantle is Flag Mantle? I didn't hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how, how close to Fremantle to a premiership? Uh, um, so th- if you think about, I think they're much closer than um, anyone thought 12 months ago, obviously. I still think they're a bit further away than most. Uh, for our supporters and people hope they can do it next year. Um, I just think their their younger players, and they've got a lot of them, are still exactly that, really quite young. The third youngest list going into this season, 2022. Right. Um, so that means their window is is open for a while. Can they do it next year? Um, don't know. But you'd want to get f- you know, 15, 20 games out of Nathan Fife. Uh, you'd want to make sure that, like they have this year, Alex Pierce, Sean Darcy... Um, and um, some of their midfield right, their midfield yeah. groups Sarong, Brayshaw, etc aren't injured um, I think if they lose one or two it can get a bit tricky just because they've they got they've got depth but they're just so young uh, it's going to be interesting to watch what, what Luke Jackson uh, Jago Amira etc do do to the team but I, they're in the window is it is it next year? don't know very good um, we'll rapid fire a few of these Nick Hanlon uh, was there any serious offers or talk about moving to West Coast? Never, no. Yeah, okay, very good. Um, Milos <laughs> underscore Nilicic. Uh, Pav, what do you reckon about chocolate on a pavlova, a sacrilege, or a welcome <laughs> addition to an otherwise stale Aussie icon that needs a bit of a revival? Is that uh, metaphorical? Oh, about, I think about so. Me? I, think yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I think they're basically saying you should dye your hair. <laughs> 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 What's this one about? Andy Pat Cullen. I don't know what this is about. Uh, is Pav still dirty on Mike Sheehan for wheeling him out onto the MCG for open mic and referencing the losing granny in the opening sequence? Yeah, what so did you do an open mic in the middle of the MCG? Or no, um, it was, you know, every open mic I've ever seen has had the warm fire, the leather chairs yeah. in the studio. So for some reason, when they said, it was yeah. It was rubbing salt into the wound. Well, let's go to the MCG and we'll talk Where about how cathartic this will be for you. And it's like, <laughs> this is brutal. This is not cathartic. That's rough. <laughs> um, it's a show. Yeah. Um, yes, I am not happy with that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Mark. Um, Actually, I blame the producer, Tommy. Tommy, who is a good guy. I'm gonna. I'm coming after you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, uh, da, 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 sorry. Uh, where's that one that was very good that we both liked? Uh, 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 cl- uh, cloudy ninety one. Uh, who would win the contest between all Australian full forward Pav and all Australian full back Pav? <laughs> <laughs> That's a clever question. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say all Australian full forward Pav because he was maybe a bit more older and mature. Right. It's it's people don't you you when you played full back you weren't a Dower Will Schofield Scragger you were <laughs> you were a McGovern intercepting yeah runoff type yeah that was player. yeah that um that was the aim to be and which was tricky when you're playing on the, when you're playing on the best forwards um, to one defend but then you know trying to turn the ball over and, and rebound so um, yeah I think uh, the the Pav all Australian full forward might have got a couple of snags on very good Lego man underscore with underscore underscore uh, hey Pav how do you like your eggs <laughs> Ooh. Um, probably scrambled alright any reason is like taste yeah yeah no particular reason but I'd go s- scrambled okay okay very good that's, uh, fine. that's an okay answer yeah uh, last one uh, Scott Scott Dale uh, did you ever think about coaching or have aspirations to get into footy admin? Certainly not coaching. I, I look at the assistant coaches 
And that's the pathway. You can't just become a senior coach. Like to do the uh, um, apprenticeship, you have to be a senior. And they look at how much footage you look at and how much coding you have to do. And like it, it's a lot about data and data capture and watching vision as compared to doing this, sitting around chatting and relationships and trying to and, and out in the field. So, no, I didn't want to become a coach. <clears throat> Admin's interesting. I think that would be something that um, I'm still p- perhaps interested in down the track. Um, but yeah, enjoying what I'm doing right now. We we got all linked to coaching at Adelaide at some point in the last few years. I swear I saw an article. Uh, I did the coaching review. I've done a few of the uh, reviews. Right. Uh, right. Right. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I'm not sure how many more I'll do, but yeah. Um, but you get a real insight into uh, a footy club, how it's running, and where the good and, good and the bad lie. Uh, I'll have the last question. How, how did you find the transition out of football and into what you're doing now? Business aspirations and ventures you got going as well. How, how was that for someone in my eyes that's been quite successful in that tr- transition? Did you find it difficult? Was it easy? Yeah, I mean, so it was easy and difficult if I can answer it that way. Easy in the sense that um, I'd been, I was fortunate enough to sort of go to university, get a couple of degrees and then become involved and invested in a couple of businesses which I um, had a kind of day job to go to. So I was kind of going to be okay if that makes sense. Now the media opportunity I always enjoyed and wanted to explore that and so the thing at Fox came up pretty quickly and then the nine thing has probably evolved. Um, so it's easy in that way but then I'll say it's hard because your whole life changes. It's not about you anymore. Um, and when I say that, I for footy or an, an elite athlete is quite selfish and you wake up and you have your food and you go to training and you, like, it's just all based around you. Now that changes when you have family and everything, but you know, primarily it's, it is about getting the best out of you because without you, there's this kind of no livelihood. So, um, and it's and your routine changes so significantly that you have to find a new balance and, and a new and so for me it was like well I played footy and then I had other aspirations uh, with you know um, business or or study or whatever and then all of a sudden I lost that so what was my other thing so yeah um, easy in in some ways but I think everyone that transitions even how successfully they transition or how successful their career has been they'll say there's lots of challenges what was your experience. It was difficult, yeah. Um, uh, probably similar. Like I was in business, had media, so it was easy in terms of I, I have things to do, but it just uh, your, your entire life changes. And and uh, yeah, I, again, probably time for another podcast. But yeah, I don't know whose responsibility it is. It's probably everyone's in terms of the AFL, AFLPA, um, the player themselves, the manager, the clubs. Like mm. whose responsibility is it to make sure that players can transition because. You know, my view on it is you, you're an elite sportsman. You, you're trying to be the best in the country at something. You need to apply yourself to that. Yes, work outside is good. Yeah. Study, work experience, all of that. But you, you won't last very long if you don't apply yourself properly to footy. So you're in that and then it finishes. It's like done. Mm. So how, how do you, you know, speaking to you, it sounds like you've done, I studied, I, I did have opportunities, but some guys don't either. So... I don't know what the answer for that is, but I, f- I found it difficult, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, lifting the draft age, going back to that, I think actually helps because guys are forced to go and get an apprenticeship, go and get a, a degree or whatever, um, and then go into their career. Now, that's a whole other, as you said, another story, but put it this way, it's not easy. Um, people do it well, other people find it really hard, and everyone's sort of on that continuum somewhere. But, um, but anyone that says it's easy is lying. There you go, liars, uh, mate. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. You've uh, you've gone above and beyond. It's been very good. Good time. on you guys. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank good, you, good man, Matty Pavlich. Done and dusted. Backchat double underscore on socials. Backchatpodcast.com.au. Thanks to our supporters: Whipper Snapper, Margaret River Roasting, Blue Bet, Shelter, Leadable Cameras. Pavs off to uh, bowl a couple of leg spinners and get his five to six ten <laughs> uh, out of the park. Uh, we'll see you next week.